So how many of you have headache? How many of you have brain fog? You all know what that is, okay. Well, I once saw an 85-year-old person who was complaining of memory impairment. And this is when I was a resident. And I, he said, doctor, would you please test my memory? I said, sure. He was there with a friend of his. And I sat down, and I had learned how to do the mini mental status test. So we did the mini mental status score together. And he blew it away. Fantastic. 30 out of 30 points. No difficulty. I said, wow, I'm going to have to ramp this up a little bit. Can you say the months of the year backwards? You want me to do what, doctor? Say the months of the year backwards. Are you sure that's what you want me to do? Yeah, I have people do it every day. Give it a try. He said, all right, doctor. If that's really what you want me to do, here goes. Uh, Rebma said, Rebma Vaughn, Robotco. <laughs> and like you, I didn't get it to Robotco. <laughs> and then I had to leave the room. All right, so I'm going to talk about something that is uh, a little bit new in my practice. And it ha well, headaches are not new in my practice. I think the initial estimates were that if you had POTS, you had about 25% likelihood of also having migraine. But in the more recent tri well, trials, in the more recent series, we're, we think it's in the 80 to 90% range. We think it's just about everybody has some manifestation of headache in addition to their postural symptoms. And these are my disclosures. I, um, a friend of mine started an air ambulance company and uh, asked for my help in getting that started, and I was happy to do so. And I also do some public speaking like this in, um, uh, for uh, physicians and as well as primary care practitioners, nurses as well, on common topics of neurology. Let me tell you about this 19-year-old woman. This woman came to me with blackouts, dizziness, and when she says blackouts, she means that her vision goes black. She loses balance, she occasionally feels faint upon position change, but actually rarely faints. And you've heard that story a lot already this weekend. The patient has a history of low iron. She gets periodic iron infusions. She hasn't felt well since the age of five. She's had dislocation of joints for, due to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, her joint hypermobility. She could do Chinese splits without practice. She last felt well at the age of 13. She began passing out at church. She has near constant lightheadedness with rapid standing. She's not had any testing to confirm that she has POTS, but like many patients, they come to see me with the symptom complex, uh, what Brent Goodman called dysautonomia, which I think is actually a better term because there are many patients who don't necessarily have 30 beat per minute rise in the middle of our visit for whatever reason. So, but she certainly had the symptoms. Her past medical history, she has joint hypermobility and dislocation since childhood, chronic nausea, diarrhea. She's found to have celiac antibody, but no small bowel biopsy, but she does seem to respond to the gluten-free diet. She has chronic daily headache, left temporal and throbbing and pounding in character with chronic nausea. She can get complete relief after two to hours lying supine. And she was recently placed on risperidone because she developed these very intense visual hallucinations whenever she would stand up. So standing longer than about five or 10 minutes, she would see these visual disturbances that were quite real, quite frightening to her. Uh, there was no auditory hallucinations, but tri primarily visual. And they would go away if she lied flat. On exam, she had mild orthostatic hypotension, uh, dropping from 98 to 84 standing on her systolic blood pressure. I was never able to document a heart rate rise greater than 30 in my office, but at home, her mother does uh, some orthostatics for me and had found on at least one, a couple occasions that her heart rate would rise greater than 30 beats per minute with uh, standing. She had no tachycardia when I tested her. As I mentioned, it went from 56 to 64. She had very hyperextensible joints, had a Baton score of nine, and her standing MRI with contrast shows no meningeal enhancement or sagging brain syndrome. So 
What we're looking at here is whether or not this, uh, this is the brainstem, this is the uh, cerebellum, and you, if you've ever heard about Chiari malformation, people are interested in these cerebellar tonsils and whether or not they're sticking down below this line here. So you can see that there's no downward uh, traction of the cerebellar tonsils. This is the rest of the brain, the MRI, and there's no abnormal enhancement here. So it appears to be a normal MRI scan. But based on that and doing the rest of her evaluation, we didn't find any evidence of a CSF leak, but I was trying to figure out why does this woman have such severe postural headache that gets completely better if she can lay down for two to four hours. And so we went forward with a blood patch and it led to complete resolution of her postural headache and dizziness. And she was able to stop the risperidone, which she was on to stop the hallucinations. So the hallucin hallucinations with standing also went away. And what is a blood patch? It is the, it's taking a tube of blood out of the arm and injecting it into the epidural space, creating essentially a patch a, that pushes up against the uh, spinal fluid region. Uh, and, and so uh, a term I heard this morning is that perhaps patients with EDS develop a floppy dura, where the dura, um, like a uh, turkey baster, collects in the bottom of the turkey baster, and that by doing an epidural blood patch, you're squeezing the spinal fluid back up to the brain, therefore relieving the, the, uh, the symptoms. So looking at this, there are a couple of reports of hallucinations in patients who have spinal fluid leaks uh, four weeks after a lumbar puncture, a 35-year-old woman developed headache and psychosis, was found to have intracranial hypotension and sagging brain on MRI, resolved with hydration. So on this, this is quite a bit different MRI than the one I just showed you. This one actually shows some downward herniation and compression of the cerebellum on the brain stem and some subdural fluid collections up here as well. So this is a, the sign of sagging brain. I'm gonna show you another example of that shortly. There was also a report of a 10-year-old boy who developed visual hallucinations after a lumbar puncture, eventually resolves after a blood patch and IV hydration. So this concept of orthostatic headache isn't really new. Dr. Lowe, the father of POTS, and Dr. Mokri described this in 2004 in a paper in neurology where they had four patients who developed postural headache when they stood up and they met criteria for POTS. And when they looked for a spinal fluid leak, they didn't find one. In two of those four patients, they performed an epidural blood patch, at least one. One of them had no response, the other had a transient improvement, but nothing long lasting. So based on that, the conclusion was that, okay, there's nothing really here. These folks do not seem to respond to epidural blood patch. The, the mechanism does not appear to be an actual spinal fluid leak. But, you know, I think um, a couple things have happened since then. Um, you know, I've learned a lot from you all, from my patients. You know, none of us went to medical school to be an autonomic specialist. This is something that, this is acquired knowledge after the fact, mainly by necessity. When I moved from Cleveland to St. Louis, I had nobody to send these patients to anymore. I used to send them to Tom Chulimsky. We were colleagues at Case Western Reserve. And when I moved to St. Louis, there just wasn't anybody. So I became that person because I needed to, I, had, I didn't know what to do with these patients. So I, I started my own autonomic laboratory and, and uh, just to add water, I became an autonomic specialist. And then finally took the exam, studied and took the exam. And I'm I think I got the 21st certificate as an autonomic specialist. So there are very few of us, as you can imagine, still doing this sort of work. And, uh, and what I learned over time was that uh, Ehrler-Danlos and uh, the hyperextensibility associated with joints probably leads to the distensibility of lots of tissues, including the spinal fluid and the dura that holds that spinal fluid in place. If you think of the brain as an egg floating inside of a mason jar full of water, you cannot break that egg if you shake that bottle, right? But if you drop the water level in half, suddenly that egg is at risk. And so 
we think that that's what happens in spinal fluid leaks, that the spinal fluid begins to drain the brain, which normally floats inside the calvarium is now, inside the skull, is now uh, subject to the forces of gravity, and now there's downward traction. And so perhaps that's part of the reason why people are getting these postural headaches. Headaches worse standing, better lying down. So as I mentioned, I owe a lot to my patients who have kept me, uh, keep helping me, push me. You know, Dr. Kinsella, you know, what have you learned this week? What are you doing for me? What, what can you do for how disabled I am? And um, one of my patients and her mother put me on to this video of Ian Carroll. Dr. Carroll from Stanford has uh, been doing epidural blood patches in patients, uh, finding a lot more I think raising awareness that CSF leaks are much more common than we think they are, and has had at least one or two patients with POTS who he thought he had a complete clinical remission by giving them epidural blood patches. And so um, I thought that was very interesting. And, and I had seen at about the same time these patients, and I'd always said, okay, well, based on the literature, there's really nothing here. Postural headache is just one of the things that patients with POTS get, but we don't necessarily see a spinal fluid leak. But the more I thought about it, particularly in these patients with EDS, perhaps the problem is the turkey baster problem. They've got this reservoir sitting at the bottom of their spinal fluid down in their lumbar spine, and that if we could squeeze that reservoir and push the CSF back up to the top, even in the absence of a leak, would that be helpful? So, so as you know, EDS is related to collagen laxity, which may predispose to venous pooling, deconditioning, and nerve sleeve incompetence. We know that the uh, joint hypermobility, we use the Baten score, and if you are able to, um, you know, it's interesting, there, there are a number of things that people can do that you can touch the forearm with your thumb, hyperextend the pinky more than 90 degrees, um, hyperextend the elbows, hyperextend the knees. You already know these criteria. Palm the floor with your knees straight. The um, EDS community rec recommends asking five different questions to screen for EDS. I only ask one question, and it's, can you show me any party tricks? <laughs> and generally, the person smiles, they laugh, and they say, Doc, watch this. And so this is some of the things that my patients are able to do with their, uh, their body. And uh, these are folks who can do splits. They were gymnasts, dancers, they can easily pull their leg up above and pull it forward while standing on the other leg. These are, um, this is a remarkable degree of flexibility. But with that degree of flexibility, those of you who suffer from this know that that comes with complications. Now, Spontaneous intracranial hypotension is something that's been recognized for about 20 years or so. These are people who behave as though they've had a lumbar puncture. They develop a leak, but they didn't have a lumbar puncture. They get spontaneous leaks, and so the usual scenario is a sudden onset of a postural headache, worse standing, better lying down. And one reason we think is that they develop these little blebs or Tarlov cysts, and some of these, like little water balloons, can rupture. Or along the CSF, which is what we're looking at here, can it come out along the nerve sleeve and form these little diverticula. And it's possible that these are the locations where the CSF dura is the weakest, and even straining at stool or coughing or sneezing or a severe coughing jag is enough to tear these little areas, uh, these nerve sleeves. This is what sagging brain looks like. Remember I mentioned what happens when the egg is no longer floating in the mason jar. The egg can now be uh, under the forces of gravity. The same thing happens with the brain. And what happens is you get this sagging brain syndrome where the cerebellar tonsils now come down and are compressing against the uh, pons, the, the brain stem, and you begin to get these fluid collections on the top. It's as though the brain is just sort of being drawn down through that very narrow hole in the back of the skull. And it leads to this very interesting MRI phenomenon called meningeal enhancement. 
when we lose CSF, something else in the scalp, in, inside the cranium, has to expand. And so that thing that expands first is our venous system. So the veins, the blood that's filling the veins around the meninges has to expand. And so what we're seeing is not meningitis. What we're seeing is those veins in the meninges beginning to fill and enhance. So this is one of the classic features of a spinal fluid leak. So the diagnostic criteria for spontaneous intracranial hypotension includes orthostatic headache, so a headache worse standing up, better lying down, plus the presence of at least one of the following. Low opening pressure, so if you do a spinal tap, they have a low, less than 60 millimeters of water, or sustained improvement of symptoms after epidural blood patching, or demonstration of any active spinal fluid uh, leak, or cranial MRI evidence of cranial hypotension or meningeal enhancement. But keep in mind, none of these absolutely require that you actually find the leak. If they have the orthostatic headache and they respond to epidural blood patch, the assumption is that there is some evidence of low CSF pressure, whether it's a leak or not. So here is a 40-year-old with POTS and intractable postural lightheadedness. She had four months of sudden onset severe dizziness. She was unable to stand more than 20 seconds. She was limited to crawling. She, uh, this is a woman who was highly functional. She was able to work every day. She worked out every day. She and her husband were endurance athletes. And one day, she developed this sudden inability to stand due to severe dizziness. The headache actually wasn't her main symptom. Her main symptom was the intractable dizziness and to stand more than about 20 seconds. Headaches wouldn't occur until the end of the day. So a little bit atypical. She was unable to work or care for her family on exam. There was little evidence of POTS on her exam. She, again, she came to me with the symptom complex, looked for some expert in the area of autonomics, and she's already been online and tried to find someone in the St. Louis, uh, Missouri region. And, and so she waited four months to get in because it's just a long time when uh, you're a limited resource. And when she came in, she told me this story, and I said, you know, I don't think this is POTS. I think you might have a spinal fluid leak. And her, so what we did then was we did a CT myelogram, and actually, I think this is an MR myelogram. Let's see, I think that's an MR myelogram. And what we see here is a dilated nerve sleeve here, so CSF is, uh, instead of staying inside this central area, you can see some of it out here in the nerve sleeve. So the thought was, okay, maybe what we found here is the source of a leak, but it can also be a normal variant. I mean, normal people can have these dilated, what are called diverticula. But despite that, we went ahead and did a epidural blood patch. I had our pain management anesthesiologist does this right in our office performed the epidural blood patch, she had an immediate recovery of all postural activities. I mean, 100% improvement. It was really quite dramatic. Functional level improves from 10 to 90% after the first epidural blood patch over several months. Symptoms recur, though less severe. She underwent a second epidural blood patch with, uh, again, uh, persistent recovery. So, I've now got about eight of these patients in various stages of evaluation and um, completion. One thing to note, the first two patients that I described for you are here, but I have several others, and one thing I want to point out to you is that about half this group are over the age of 50. So anytime a person presents with n new POTS over the age of about 40, that's un atypical. Something else is often going on, and you all know already that POTS isn't a diagnosis, it's a syndrome for which we need to find some primary cause if we can. Sometimes we can't, but uh, so anytime an older person, and I, I'm sorry to say older, but it is older than our typical age of tw in our 20s when we typically see patients with POTS, when we start to see that older age group, 40 and over, as a new diagnosis, I'm thinking of some secondary cause some of these patients do have uh, 
Herler Danlos, so they certainly have hyperextensibility on their Baten score. This one, the first patient had it was nine out of nine. Uh, ND means not detected because I hadn't been doing the Baten score until the last few months, so I'm waiting for these folks to come back in the office and I'm going to retest them. Uh, but uh, uh, several of these folks do have uh, evidence of EDS. So I bring that up not to say to you that this is common and that you should all go immediately back to your doctors and give you an epidural blood patch, but I bring it up because, uh, you know, I debated bringing this up because obviously the minute we say that this happens in one of a thousand people, we all think that that's us. The far more common is migraine. And so I'm going to spend the rest of this time talking about migraine. And um, let's see, I, there was one thing. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, there is an argument to be made then for a clinical trial of an epidural blood patch. I know it sounds dramatic, but it's quite a benign disorder. Of that whole group of eight patients, well, I've only done them in seven. One, I haven't, uh, I, I have her ready to go for next week. But of the seven, I've had one complication, and that was a woman who developed burning pain down her leg after the injection, and that lasted about 24 hours and then resolved. But otherwise, um, this has been a very safe um, procedure. I use it as a therapeutic trial to see if they can respond to it. I think it's worth trying in anybody with a persistent postural headache uh, in, in a patient who uh, may meet the criteria for diagnosis of intracranial hypotension. And it's certainly less invasive and has fewer complications than putting a port in for continuous IV saline or IVIG or some of the other things that we do to people, fluticortisone, the, the complications of hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, supine hypertension. So, so relative to the other things that you all routinely take for granted as part of your treatments, I think this is even more benign. So something to think about. All right, let's talk about migraine. As I mentioned, migraine is common in POTS. We used to think it was only about a quarter of patients with POTS. More recent series suggests that it's well over 80%. This is four or more pounding or throbbing headaches in your life with nausea or light sensitivity. I use this mnemonic called SULTANS, S-U-L-T-A-N-S. S is severe, U-L unilateral, T throbbing, A activity worsens a headache. You need two of those four criteria. And then N and S, you need one of those two, N nausea or S sensitivity to light or sound. If you have migraine without aura, well, so I went through that already. And then there's also migraine with aura, or what we used to call classic migraine, where a person develops, a, in addition to the headache, usually before it, they get an aura, usually a visual disturbance, bright flashing lights, zigzag lines, lightning bolts, or they may feel a spreading wave of, of numbness over the face. And this is typically followed by a headache within about 60 minutes. Cortical spreading depression is a phenomenon that we understand to be the main pathophysiology of migraine, that it's as though, if you think of a seizure, as someone turns up the volume button too high on the neuron, there's too much electrical activity, migraine's the opposite. It's as though someone takes the volume button, turns it down, they get this spreading wave of cortical depression. It usually begins back here in the occipital cortex, and it slowly migrates forward at a rate of three millimeters per minute. And if it stays in the occipital cortex, we might get a few flashes of light or zigzag lines, what, what one of my patients at Mount Sinai when I practiced in Cleveland used to call schwindels. So he had a few schwindels, a little, few little flashes of light off in one side. And, but if it moves out of the occipital cortex and moves to our sensory brain, our parietal lobe, that's when we start to get the nummy tinglies, the stuff that worries us, are, am I actually having a TIA? And this is uh, the tip off there is that because it moves at three millimeters per minute, the spreading wave, it begins as numbness in the fingers and then it slowly works its way up over minutes, not seconds, but minutes to the arm, then it goes to the mouth and then it goes to the leg. And um, so that pattern, that slow sensory march is often what I'm asking for, trying to elicit that history to help reassure me that we're dealing with transient migranous attack, TMA, 
as opposed to TIA, transient ischemic attack, from a blocked blood vessel. Obviously, if you have a stroke, a blocked blood vessel, you're going to be face, arm, and leg all at once, and it's usually not just numbness, it's weakness, slurred speech, trouble swallowing, and other things. So cortical spreading depression is a phenomenon that has been described for a number of years. There's a very elegant demonstration of that. This is this wave of reduced blood flow that begins asymmetrically in the occipital cortex. And as we move forward, you can see the black represents the loss of blood flow, reflecting the loss of neuronal activation. And it just continues to move forward, so such that by the end of this uh, time period, uh, it's way up uh, towards the middle of the brain. So, make sure I got that right. So, there's newer evidence showing that in addition to headache, this is very much related to our other functional symptoms. What do I mean by functional symptoms? Those symptoms for which we don't find a structural neurologic problem. Uh, some of the, 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 the massive sheer number of symptoms that you all suffer from are often overwhelming to your physicians, as I'm sure you've experienced. And having a model for understanding that I think is critical. We now know that migraine is a major accompaniment and a risk factor for having not just one symptom, but 40 symptoms. And I call that the symptom snowball, that it just gets bigger and bigger the more it rolls downhill. So managing that is a big part of what we do in our clinic in addition to the other manifestations. And we think that there is a connection with migraine. Thank you. So as I mentioned already, complicated migraine is a persistent neurologic residue of a migraine attack. It's a frequent stroke mimic. It's one of the most common reasons why people come into the ER who look like they're having a stroke but actually are not having one. Um, and I mentioned the slow sensory march. Huh. What abortive therapies do we have? Abortive, meaning what can I do to get rid of my headache right now as opposed to prophylactic or preventative? What can I take today to prevent the headache I'm gonna have next week? So abortive agents are those agents we can take right now to try and get some relief. Excedrin is a perfectly good drug. It's a combination of aspirin, Tylenol, and caffeine. Uh, and in the short term, it can be a very effective drug and is certainly a reasonable thing to try. But the problem is, is that we overdo it. In fact, we overdo most abortive therapies when we suffer from chronic headache. It turns out that if we're using anything more than two days a week as an abortive agent, it winds up inducing a phenomenon called medication overuse headache, what we used to call medication rebound headache. Other things that are helpful, sumatriptan, elatriptan, zolmatriptan, Maxalt, there are a number of other agents. Butalbital and opioids are no longer recommended for any type of head pain, if possible. We uh, want to get people off this. Uh, we have a, a national epidemic of opioid overuse. Most patients on street heroin started with pills. Most people who have an opioid addiction started with a prescription that somebody gave them. So we, for the first time, 2016, we have finally seen the curve of new prescriptions for opioids begin to decline. So we're heading, we're beginning to head in the right direction to stem what has become, uh, has been termed the worst man-made epidemic uh, in history. The key thing with any abortive agent is not to exceed two to three days per week to avoid rebound. Triptans, these are a major advance in migraine therapy. Sumatriptan is the most commonly available because it's generic. It's on virtually all Medicaid plans. It's on most prescription plans as the preferred first level drug. It also has the most ways of using it, sub-Q, intranasal, uh, a no, no uh, needle injection, um, as well as a pill. They all act by suppressing nausea, confusion, autonomic dysfunction, and pain associated with the migraine attack. They differ only in their pharmacokinetics. Sumatriptan comes in 25 to 100 milligram pills, or you could also take it as sub-Q for rapid onset of action. There is Zomig. This is Maxalt sublingual, so a person who's having severe nausea can't possibly tolerate swallowing a pill. I'll put them on Maxalt melt. They just stick it under their tongue. It dissolves. They don't have to swallow it. Just try not to swallow it, in fact, because it'll be absorbed much better through the oral mucosa. 
If a person has a headache that lasts six to 10 hours, typically, I'll use something more long-acting, like something like Frova or Relpax. Okay, so that leaves abortive therapy. Let's talk about prophylactic therapy. What do we take to prevent the headache we might have next month? There are a number of FDA-approved agents. They include propranolol. And the nice thing about propranolol is it's also pretty good for POTS. So this is usually the first drug I start with, usually at a very low dose, 10 milligrams twice a day, gradually going up to 20 milligrams twice a day. That may be all that's needed to treat, or at least to help alleviate both. There are anticonvulsants, topiramate and Depakote, tricyclic antidepressants, nortriptyline. Also, amitriptyline can be used. Both of those are pennies per pill. And anaprox can also be used for perimenstrual migraine. Uh, for those of you who might say, you know what, doctor, I have terrible, terrible headaches, but I don't want to take anything unnatural in my body. I don't want any prescription medication. Anybody here like that? OK. Well, uh, I have patients like that. And so there are two nice options for them. One is MyGrelief. MyGrelief you can buy over the counter at Walgreens and many other commercial pharmacies. Uh, this is a combination of feverfew, um, magnesium, and riboflavin. You have to take it twice a day, but it can help prevent migraine. The other is Butterbur extract, otherwise known as Patotalax. That you have to take three times a day, but it's also Schedule A for pregnancy, safe for nursing, along with MyGrelief. Okay, chronic migraine is a headache that lasts more than 15 days per month. And you might say, well, uh, you know, I really have three severe headaches per month. Well, I, then the next question is, how many actual, how many days per month do you have some kind of head pain? You mean any head pain? Yes. Oh, 20, 25? And that's, it's amazing how commonly I hear that from, from you all, because you are so used to living with some discomfort that you just figure, okay, this is normal. But it's not normal. We shouldn't be having 20 or even 15 or even 10 headache days a month. But after a while, we just assume, well, this is my life. So I guess I guess I have to get used to that. So at least one of these headaches lasting more than four hours a day meets previous headache criteria and increasing frequency over three months. Recent developments, Botox is around. How many here are on Botox? Anyone? OK. And uh, inhaled dihydroergotamine, sumatriptan patch, Namenda has been found to be a helpful preventative agent if Topamax and Propranolol fail. Vagal stimulators, uh, there's someone here talking about vagal stimulators out in the hallway. We also have occipital and supraorbital stimulators. There's a new, new thing on the market, not quite on the market, but coming as a monoclonal antibody. We're com we have a new immune therapy for chronic migraine. One shot every six months or a year may be enough to help block migraine. We hope to have that on the market by January. Botox for migraine, how does it work? Well, we just put a slight amount underneath the skin, and that seems to, to limit the, the uh, spread of pain to the rest of the head. It's FDA approved for refractory chronic migraine. You have to have tried and failed two preventative agents, and you must have otherwise filled the criteria of greater than 15 headache days per month. And 70% of patients experience at least 50% relief of headache after three sets of injections. This is done every three months. So uh, we continue it for at least three sets of injections before we decide if it's going to work. I mentioned the immune therapy for migraine. This is something I want to spend just a little bit time on, dietary triggers. This book, at the end of our discussion, I say, please bring out your cell phone and type into Google, heal your headache, and then let me know when you see the lady with the smoke coming out of her ears. And that gives me enough time to write a few notes while somebody's on their cell phone. And I recommend this book. This book helps bring down your triggers. So while I'm trying to give you a medicine to raise your threshold and make it hard if you have a headache in the first place, we also need to work on triggers. What are the things that we can control? Well, we can't control barometric pressure, at least not yet. But we can control foods, things like caffeine, chocolate, MSG, uh, processed meats and fish like bacon and beef jerky, pickled herring. Uh, there are a variety of onions, NutraSweet, uh, oranges, citrus, bananas, 
Certain dairy products can do this, hard cheeses. Anything that goes on a pizza, unfortunately, is likely to trigger a headache. So, and I know that sounds like a lot to give up, but once patients go on this for about a period of three months, they can begin to reintroduce one thing at a time and see what was their actual trigger. And I, can, I just can tell you that this has been a game changer in my practice. It wasn't some fancy new medication, it was a simple diet. So if you've never tried this, consider treating yourself to this book. It's an eye-opener. All right, so things to try for intractable migraine. I do this in the emergency room. I'll have people take two liters of IV saline and then a gram of magnesium every six hours. Uh, generally, this one time can help abort the headache. I might also add IV valproic acid, Depakon IV. Sometimes we do a lidocaine infusion and sometimes we give dihydroergotamine. Here's a 37-year-old man with lifelong migraine and develops six weeks of unremitting headache. It's bitemporal, throbbing, three to seven out of 10 in severity, present upon awakening in the morning. It's relieved with acetaminophen, aspirin, caffeine, excedrin migraine. He has no visual disturbances, no, visual, no um, loss of vision, no nausea or light sensitivity. And he had been on cyclosporin for three months for alopecia. He had lost all of his hair. So his uh, dermatologist put him on a immunosuppressant. And he was thinking that that was the cause of his worsening headache. So his question for me is, do you think it's my cyclosporin doing this? But I asked him one simple question. And how many excedrin a day are you taking? And the answer was 32. 32. Don't laugh, because it's, it's quite common. How many of you can reach within an arm's length and grab a bottle of ibuprofen? OK, so the next time you're in a restaurant and you have a headache and you need some ibuprofen, all you have to do is tap the lady on the, on the shoulder behind you at the next table and say, do you happen to have any? And someone at that table almost certainly is going to have some. It's extremely common. So if, if you're walking around with a bottle of ibuprofen or you just don't feel quite right until you have that morning cup of coffee, you probably got some migraine or at least some rebound headache as well. It's common, folks. 25% of women have this, 17% of men. Uh, the con two minutes, thank you. All right, I will keep moving. So how do we treat this? Medication overuse headache. We have to educate. Uh, each other. We have to remind each other that it's, you can treat your headache aggressively, but you can't do it more than two days. If it's taking, if you're still having a headache more than two days a week, then we need to do something prophylactically. We need to have you take something every day to prevent the migraine, to raise the threshold, and also bring down your triggers. So two days a week. Other things that I like trying are Xanaflex. This is tizanidine. It's an antispasm medicine. I'll have people take this two milligrams three times a day for maybe a couple of weeks while they get off their caffeine, they get off their ibuprofen, they get off all the other stuff that they're taking on a daily basis. And I might temporize and keep them out of the ER by doing some occipital nerve blocks. About five cc's of lidocaine over these bumps on the back of the head can block that occipital nerve and give some temporary relief. Sometimes they have to admit people to the hospital, and I'll use what's called Raskin protocol with dihydroergotamine. When should we image? I get this question a lot. When should we image patients with bad headaches? I tell them that the, the answer is you use the mnemonic SNOOPS, S, systemic illness. If they have fever along with their headache, if they have neurologic signs, numbness, tingling, weakness on one side of the body, if their onset of headache is sudden or abrupt, if they're older, over the age of 50, and it's a new headache, those people should be imaged. If their previous headache history has suddenly changed, that's a good reason to image them. And if they have secondary risk factors like HIV and cancer. So in summary, migraine is the most common subtype of headache in patients with POTS. Um, but not all postural dizziness is POTS. There's a lot of people who come in with postural orthostatic intolerance who don't necessarily meet the criteria for POTS. Maybe some of you have been told, you don't have POTS. You know, you're, you've got all these other symptoms, but your heart rate doesn't go up. Well, I, I think that's maybe a little too strict. But in any case, not all postural dizziness meets all the criteria for POTS. Headaches are worsened with standing plus orthostatic intolerance should raise the possibility of, an, of intracranial hypotension. Joint hypermobility is a risk factor for CSF leaks and possibly postural headache without leak. A clinical trial of an epidural blood patch is reasonable and is low risk and may be partially helpful. So I will 
stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. How much time for questions do we have? We're out of time. All right. Say it again. OK. That's fine. So I can take a few questions? OK. Any questions? Yes. So the question is, do you still see duralectasia in patients with EDS? Quite frankly, we haven't studied it enough to know. We know that uh, Ehrler-Danlos joint hypermobility is a risk factor for spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, uh, but, and we know that those nerve sleeves are a little more fragile, and maybe even just a good cough or a sneeze is enough to open them up. But in terms of have we documented this, you know, turkey baster phenomenon? No, we haven't gotten there yet. There's not much um, in reference to EDS with it. It's specifically like a Marfan's thing, apparently. But so the comment was that uh, um, there, uh, this person has identified this in um, patients with Marfan's, but hasn't seen that in EDS. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. All right, other questions I can't answer? Yes. I'm sorry, do you mind repeating that? So my 16 year old has had a headache 24 seven for four and a half years. It doesn't get better with anything. So what do you do with that, right? Yeah. So what do you do with the, the per, I'm sorry, what do you do with the person who has intractable daily headache? And is there any postural component? It doesn't get better right. Just right. So he gets relief only by sleeping. Yeah. So, you know, chronic daily headache, there are five subtypes. The most common we think is chronic migraine. And uh, that would certainly be my first suspicion. 80% uh, of people with chronic migraine also have medication overuse or medication rebound headache. So it's the stuff that they're taking on a daily basis. Caffeine, I would look to eliminate caffeine from his diet. If he's tried and failed two or more preventative agents, which I suspect he has, I would consider Botox. I'm assuming he's already been on Botox. Uh huh. So, so the comment was that the, he had been on Topamax, and it did get temporarily better. But then the thought was that the Topamax may actually be worsening his headache. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that as well. It, the, if he's not been on a second agent, I would go in that direction, either propranolol or um, Tridelavil. Okay. So he's already tried and failed two preventative agents. He would be a candidate for Botox. That would be the next step, at least for me. Okay? Yes. Other questions? Yes. Hang on, let me let me let me find you. I think this works better. If we just that way I don't have to misinterpret what you said. Uh, hi. Uh, jumping in a trampoline if they have a, a a leak, is that bad? If they jump on a trampoline? It was recommended for EDS for the um, joints and all that. But then somebody told me that it might not be good for the, uh, if they have a leak of some sort. So the comment is, or the question is, is jumping on a trampoline bad if you have a postural headache and you have EDS? Because someone had recommended jumping on a trampoline if you have EDS. That's a great question. Does he, do the headaches worsen jumping on the trampoline? Okay. Yeah. So sometimes. So uh, I, I think it's just one of those things that um, it's just a common sense thing. If the headaches get worse, stop doing that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh huh. 
clear, yellowy, she got a weird taste in her mouth. And the only way they said they could say for sure if it was a spinal leak was if we could collect it, which she couldn't collect it carrying around a cup all of the time. But then the headache stopped and the leaking stopped. Is there any chance that it would just spontaneously repair, like it would spontaneously rupture? Well, the good news is that uh, a leak from the nose, if that's CSF, rarely causes headache unless it becomes meningitis. It's, it's the leaks in the spinal column that lead to postural headache. She more likely had an upper respiratory tract infection with postnasal drip that was coming out when she leaned forward and had an associated headache just with her acute illness. She felt like it was more of a blood pressure headache, uh -huh. an intense headache that would have caused that. But I mean, is that something that could have been or no? You know, I would never say never, but given the fact that it's spontaneously remitted, given the fact that there was serous drainage, you know, it was kind of greenish or yellowish, mm -hmm and it wasn't clear, I'd say those things favor an upper respiratory tract infection. It was clear, but with a yellow. With a yellow tint. Yeah, I, I, I think we're, pro and, the, and given the fact that it's, now it is true that people with spontaneous intracranial hypotension can spontaneously repair them. And most of them probably do get better on their own. Uh, we think that actually in that situation, we do want people to be on a lot of caffeine during the period of time uh, when they're having the severe postural headache. We actually try a very high dose caffeine at home before we have them come into the hospital. Yeah. Okay. All right. How about, uh, do I have time for one more? Okay. We need the room. All right, folks. That's it. Thanks again for your attention. <laughs>